Pray with me for the speaker, if you will. Father, thank you so much for the beauty of another day. Thank you for your love that provides everything for us. And especially, Father, we're grateful for this time that we can be together to worship you. Father, we pray that you'll be with Todd, that you'll help him remember the things he studies, that he might present us a lesson that we understand, that we hear, and we apply to our lives. Help us to daily be more the person you want us to be. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. And no, I'm not Gary Coburn. So for those of you who came this morning, because I told you Gary's preaching this next week, bait and switch, it always works. Uh, so anyway, Jan and I are here, and we've been questioned a lot, what are you doing here? Because you're supposed to be out of town this week. Uh, thank you for missing us in advance. Uh, no, Jim got out of the hospital, and he's staying with Jana's sister. He's doing well. His biopsy came back, so no new cancer beyond what he has today. So God is good, church, and all the time. <laughs> amen, amen. Thank you all for your prayers. Thank you for your questions and your concerns. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, please be turning to the book of Habakkuk. Today we come to our last lesson in this great book that the Lord has, has given us in His Word. So let me remind you this morning how this book, this oracle from Habakkuk, got started. So Habakkuk saw a vision. In fact, Habakkuk saw things taking place around him that were concerning. Habakkuk saw things that were breeding fear and frustration. Not only in himself, but also breeding fear and frustration in those in which the community of, of which he lived. And so Habakkuk went to the Lord. And I want to pause there this morning and ask you a question, church. Have you ever had a season? Or, or scratch that. Have you ever had a week or maybe a couple of weeks, where, where things have transpired in the world around you, or in the country around you, or in your community, or maybe even in your church environment, and you've had some questions. You've had some frustrations. You've had some flat-out fears, and so you begin, like Habakkuk, to ask God, as you look at your surrounding culture, God, what's going on? God, are, are you watching this? How long, O oh Lord? How long? And when you think about what's been going on the, in the streets of our inner cities for the last six months or a year or four years, and you see the disrespect that our, our police and those who are called to service well, what they receive. And, and the lack of caring for those in our community who are either rightfully or wrongfully have their lives cut short too early. And this is a little tough one. You see the hatred that people have for one another because they disagree with another's choice in a candidate or a platform or a belief or, heaven forbid, a religion. Again, either right or wrong. Have you seen this and ever asked that question? God, your word says you know when a sparrow falls. Well, well, how about these? How much longer, God? Are you watching, God? Are you watching, God? And then it drills down. And it hits real close like it did for me this week when I... I got news that a good friend passed away. And you hear that news. Or, or you hear the news that, that a good friend doesn't want to receive, or maybe that a family member wants to receive, that no one wants to receive. Or again, heaven forbid that your candidate loses, and you know that they were cheated. And some of us want to cry, and others can't help but laugh. Well, an interesting thing about these past few weeks, I talked with a couple of preacher friends of mine, real preachers, not play preachers like I, 
And they said, after what's happened the last couple of weeks, they were going to change their sermon for this Sunday. And that struck me. Man, change your sermon for this Sunday. And then I thought, and you know, church, because of God and the Holy Spirit and Him alone, we don't have to do that today. We don't have to change what we're talking about because what we've been preaching on for the last three months God has been preparing us for events like these that have taken place over the past few weeks. You know, when you watch those around you and, and you hear that loved ones are going through a, a tough time and through trials, trials that no one should have to go through, and you see our country in chaos, and, and God for months, well, he's been telling this body of believers here how we move from fear and frustration to faith. And we know that more than ever, our God up above is leading this family, church. Amen? Amen. So this morning, if you have your bulletins with you, inside is our sermon notes, and I want to I talk to you right off the bat on our last lesson from the book of Habakkuk. And this morning, we're going to talk about a summary of the book of Habakkuk. Now, last week we talked about chapter 2, and we talked about five things, the five woes, five things we need to avoid if you want to move from frustration and fear to faith. And then in chapter 3, Habakkuk does something, and I've set this up for weeks, he does something that no other prophet do, has ever done, where he has completed that process of moving from complaining to celebrating. The process of moving from questioning God to trusting God. And now we come to chapter 3, and chapter 3 in its entirety is all a song. It's all a celebration of faith. And, and then, towards the end of that chapter, a summary of the entire book of Habakkuk is found in the last four verses of that song. So let's read together this morning in Habakkuk chapter 3, starting in verse 16. A summary of this entire book. And if you have your Bibles out with you, I want to encourage you to draw a line right before verse 16, and then out in the margin, write great summary of the entire book of Habakkuk, starting in verse 16. Thank you, Zach, for reading that earlier for me. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs, they trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Church, Habakkuk's first thing this morning, number one in your sermon notes, the first part of the summary of the book of Habakkuk is a response of stunned awe. A response of stunned awe. I, I can't believe this is happening, and I can't believe this is going to happen. Did you notice Habakkuk's language? My, my, my heart pounded. M my lips quivered. Decay began to creep into my bones. My legs, I couldn't stand anymore. My legs were trembling. He has a response of stunned awe. And I've talked to a lot of people over the last few weeks, and I will tell you, there are many people Many of us today who have that same stunned awe with the things that have happened in this world, we stand there with stunned awe and we go, we go, God, God, but God's not done. So let's read verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. What we have, church, what we have here, number two, is a recognition of coming loss. You see, Habakkuk hasn't buried his head in the sand, and Habakkuk's not out of touch with reality. This response of stunned awe now moves to a recognition of, this is going to be tough. This is going to be hard. And then we move to Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Where Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. And he makes me like the feet of a deer. Makes my feet like the feet of a deer. And he enables me to tread on the heights. 
So the third part of our summary this morning of the book of Habakkuk is we have a resolution of joyous trust. I will be joyful in God my Savior, Habakkuk says. So the next thing I want to do this morning, as we look at this response of stunned awe and this recognition of a coming loss that's going to be tough, church. It's going to be tough. And now Habakkuk digs in deep and he says, God is my strength. He says, I'm going to resolve to trust, to a trust that brings about joy in my life. In fact, he says, I'm singing about it at this very moment. Because church, this is not theology for Habakkuk. It's doxology for Habakkuk. He's not talking about one day, or someday, or down the road, I'm going to rejoice. Church, we're reading about his resolve right here in the midst of this song. And so what I want to do for the next few minutes is take a look at the faith of Habakkuk. How does this unbelievable shift take place in Habakkuk's life? Did you notice the language? Did you notice the metaphor he used? Where was he in verse 16? Oh man, my heart was pounding. My lips were quivering. Decay was in the bone of my legs. My feet were trembling. And then did you see where he was just three verses later? Because of the Lord. My feet were trembling. But now my feet are like that of a deer. Oh, there's no trembling anymore. And I'm not going to remain where I was. Because of God, I tread the heights. Like a deer to the top of the mountain. That's where you'll see me, because of my God. You know, church, Christians, Christians are people who not just survive during hard times, but Christians are people, and it does start there, but because we have the Lord's strength in us, we begin to react in ways because of Him, and only because of Him and His power, that the world says, What's happening? What's happening? How is this happening? And Habakkuk says, this is how it happens. A great shift happens. A response of stunned awe and a recognition of coming loss has now given way to a resolution of joyous trust. So let me ask you this morning, church, how does frustration move to faith? How does fear, real fear, move to faith? How does that shift happen? Well, let's read these same verses again. The same verses we just read, seeking the answers to those questions. That question. How do we make that shift? And I want us to dig in this morning, church, because God wants you to know how to move from fear to faith. And if you're living in that world right now, this is for you. So how do you move from frustration to a joyous trust? How can you move from questioning God or to questioning God, from complaining to God? How do you move to someone who's a testimony by the power of God that you live in? Habakkuk 3 and 16. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet, yet, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation that's invading us. Does it get worse? Though the fig tree doesn't bud and though there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the the fields produce no food, And by the way, there are no sheep in the pen. And there is no cattle in the stalls. Yet. Yet. Yet I will rejoice. Yet I will be joyful in God my Savior. Because the Sovereign Lord is my strength. And because of that, He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He allows me to go places I could never go before. Because he enables me to tread the heights. 
Church, Habakkuk gets there because he makes the shift with one powerful mindset of faith. Displaying one little yet powerful word. And that word is yet. Yet. Though the facts be this, and, and the fears and the frustrations and the things that cause them are real, I'm not denying that. Yet, I will wait. Yet, I will rejoice. I, I was talking to a good friend this past week, and he, he was relaying to me a story about a recent experience he'd had with his Jeep Wrangler, you know, uh, one like the Dunaway's Drive or like Grant used to drive. He and his wife were going out to the lake, and they were going to go out for a picnic. And when they got there, he went to put his Jeep in park. And so he grabbed the shifter, and he said, it just moved back and forth. Zach, you ever experienced that? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I had the shifter. It just went freely, forwards and backwards. And, and the car wouldn't go into park. And it also wouldn't go into reverse. And he said, I was trapped because I was afraid to turn the Jeep off because you know if it's in drive and you turn it off, it won't turn on again. And so I thought of my sermon and I asked him, were you frustrated? He said, you bet you. I said, were you fearful? And he said, I was afraid because I couldn't back the car up. I couldn't take it to a garage. I couldn't even get out and push it because my foot was on the brake, and if I took my foot off the brake, it was going to go. So I sat there, frustrated and fearful, and the only option I had was to turn the car off. And so I called AAA and come tow it. And he was out in the country, and that's where the funny part of this story comes in. So when the tow truck got there, he told the guy what had happened, and the guy said, well... That's easy. You see, your problem is the gear shift bushing. And then the guy explained that he had a couple of Jeeps himself, and it's a very common problem. As a matter of fact, he just had this problem with one of his just a couple of months earlier. And he bought his gear shift bushing off of the web. Well, actually, he bought a package of five of them, and he still had four of them sitting in the glove box of his truck. And so within an hour, he had taken the console apart, put a new gear shift bushing on, and my friend was ready to go. Amen for country folk, right? Amen for country folk. You know, the interesting thing about this story is that that Jeep weighs over 4,000 pounds. But without that tiny little 80-cent plastic part that weighs no more than an ounce, that Jeep's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, some of our Christian walks in this room right now they're not shifting into gear. They're stuck in neutral, or even worse, they're stuck in park. Because we don't know that little word, that little 80 cent part, yet. Oh, it's tough. It's real tough. And when that 80 cent part is missing, that word, that attitude, although it's little church, it's powerful. And without the yet, let's think about that for a second. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he didn't want what was coming to come his way. Yet, let not my will, but yours be done. Church, do you hear me this morning? The yet, that yet, is the reason why we're all sitting here today. Without that yet, none of us are here. Without that yet, there is no cross. And without that yet, there is no resurrection. But it took one to be submissive. It took one to be faithful. It took one who lived by faith. Brothers and sisters, we want to be people today who understand yet. Now there are two yets in Habakkuk chapter 3. Number one, the first yet, and this is in your, your sermon outline today, yet I will wait. That's what Habakkuk said. Now, the translation for us today, and we've been talking about this in this series, and we were talking about it in the series before this on prayer, 
yet I will wait in prayer. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1, and I, I found this this week and reading over this and over this, and someone asked me last week, what, what version were you reading from and how do you pick your version? And I, I was looking through different versions, and Habakkuk 2 and 1, actually the King James Version reads the best. And it says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. So Habakkuk says, I'm going out to the tower. I'm not going to stay around all these people where, where I can kind of be able to think about you, Lord. No, I'm going to go out to this tower. I'm going to go out to the field. I'm going to go out to the ramparts. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to wait. Because waiting on the Lord, church, it takes three things. The first thing it takes is a deliberate detachment. A deliberate detachment. You see, early in the morning, who was it? Jesus, that went off by himself? Church, we are called to deliberately detach. Because we can never be for others the way we are to be for others until we are with God the way we're intended to be with God. And so we deliberately detach. Yet, and this is how we wait. The second thing we have to do to wait is be expectant. Habakkuk deliberately detaches in the tower, and he doesn't go, you look, Lord, I'm waiting. This is a big waste of time. No, he says, I'm waiting, Lord, and I'm watching from afar to see what you will do. Church, we need to deliberately detach, and we need to be expectant for what the Lord has in store for our lives. And number three, we need to be tenacious. You know, Habakkuk doesn't just go there for a moment. He says, I'm going to wait there until I get an answer. And later in that chapter, God says to him, well, your answer will come at the appointed time. I'm not going to bring it, now, now hear this church, I'm not going to bring it just because you're waiting right here and now. There's an appointed time. And you'll have to wait until that time. So we need to be deliberate in prayer by ourselves. And we need to be people who are expectant on God, not our own power. And we need to be tenacious in our prayers and persistent, holding on. And there are times, like he did to Habakkuk, that God's going to say, you know what, you wouldn't believe me even if I told you. And so we have to be tenacious. Because we're in a relationship with a living God. A living God whose plans for us far out see, exceed our plans for ourselves. So yet, I will wait. The second yet in our summary of Habakkuk. Yet I will rejoice. You know, the Apostle Paul is very fond of quoting Habakkuk. In Romans 1 and 17, he quotes Habakkuk 2 and 4. The righteous will live by faith. He does that again in the, in the book of Galatians. And the Hebrew writer affected by Paul does it in Hebrews 10 and 38. The righteous will live by faith. But that's not the only places where Paul quotes Habakkuk. And this other one's a little loose translation, but one nonetheless. Where in his, his, his letter to the church in Philippi in chapter 4 and verse 4, he said, I'm in prison, yet I will rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Church, that is what it is to have the Father's strength in you. That's what it is to go to the next level with God. You, you know, I was, well, before I get there, Habakkuk had a lot of things going for him. But he didn't have all the things that we have going for us today. Now, let me explain. Today, we know how Habakkuk's prayer was answered. And you might say, well, Todd, it was kind of answered. I mean, the Babylonians came in and they leveled the place. And then there was a late addition to the sermon this week. So if you will, quickly turn to Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2. Because Habakkuk in his song of celebration, we see that Habakkuk, in offering up a prayer, well one that wasn't really answered in his time, so to speak, but it was answered 600 years later. 
And that's the reason why we're here today. Because church, in the midst of tough times, in the midst of fear, in the midst of frustration, in the midst of looking at what's going on in our culture today, and if you think it's pretty out there, it's not church. In the midst of seeing your family members and your friends and your church family who are struggling with unbelievable trials, Habakkuk's prayer is answered. Habakkuk says this to the Lord in verse 2. Lord, God, I, I, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. You, you know, that Egypt stuff. Those, those miracles. Salvation from bondage. Will you repeat them in our day? I.e., will you repeat them right now, God? In our time, make them known. And here's the kicker. In wrath, God, in your wrath, will you remember mercy? Go ahead and bring up that next slide, if you will. Right there is the answer to Habakkuk's prayer. When your faith comes, God, would you somehow, in the midst of that wrath, and I don't know how you're going to do it, God, but in the midst of your wrath, will you somehow remember mercy? And about that time, Habakkuk 1 and 5 comes back into my mind where God said, you wouldn't believe it, Habakkuk. You wouldn't believe it, even if I told you. You wouldn't believe what I'm going to do on a hill called Golgotha. And he tells us today the good news, and we go, you're right. You're right. But who would do that with their own son? The wrath that was meant, John 3 and 36, Romans 1 and 17, the wrath that was meant for us, church. Remember us. Remember the mercy that we didn't deserve. And God says, I told you. You wouldn't believe me, even if I told you. You know, a few weeks I spoke, spoke with a brother who's going through a very, very tough time. And I asked him how he was doing, and he answered, I'm blessed. And, and oddly enough, I'm thankful. And, and you know, Todd, I'm good. Church, if you don't know the Lord... Who can bring about that in your life? Guess what? You can know him today. Because it's who we've been talking about for the last three months. He knows you. And he wants you to know him. He wants you to be tenacious in your prayers. So church, this morning I implore you, today on Jesus Christ's behalf, be reconciled. And you know, each week we, we offer an invitation, and, and it's a plight invitation. Church, I've only been preaching for about two and a half years from now, and I'm afraid I've been messing this part up. I believe it's Acts 17 and 30, the Acts of the Apostles that says it this way, in the past God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has said a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he's appointed. And he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. You see, church, this is not an invitation. God commands us to repent. God commands us to repent. And while that may sound harsh, and while that may not sound very 2020, let me, I don't know, let me give you an analogy. What if your child were about to stick their finger in the fire? What if your child were playing out in the front yard here and getting ready to run right in front of a car speeding down Beach Drive? You'd command them to stop, right? You'd command them to pull their finger back. You'd command them to get away from the road. 
Church, that's what God is doing for us today. Lovingly and caringly, commanding us to go the path of Habakkuk and throw off this world by celebrating our relationship with him. Be tenacious in prayer, church, and please be reconciled with him this morning. Be reconciled while we stand and sing.